Um, now I want to uh, uh, introduce another uh, fellow trustee, distinguished trustee, Amina Saeed, um, who is going to um, talk about her experiences in Pakistan. Uh, she was head of uh, OUP in Pakistan, managing director, as you know, for 30 years. And she's also set up her own successful uh, publishing house, Lighthouse. And she's also been uh, a driving force in the new push to have literature festivals in Pakistan, um, which are increasingly successful. And she's going to talk to us. Uh, she's had prizes from three countries, I see, um, so very distinguished. And she's going to talk to us about her personal story um, I, uh, in, in, in the publishing world. And the title of her talk is The Freedom to Publish in Pakistan. Amina, please. Thank you, Paul. So, um, salam alaikum, everyone, and good evening. Um, I'll be talking to you about my own experience in publishing in Pakistan, and there'll be a few slides which I've uh, asked my colleague Faryal Farooq to help me out. So, thank you, Faryal. Um, prior to independence, Karachi was a small town of a quarter of a million people compared to 25 million people today. It had little publishing infrastructure or activities. However, the arrival in 1947 of large numbers of educated and sophisticated people from India, uh, and also because Karachi became the capital of the new country and it's only uh, business and banking center that it experienced, publishing experienced rapid growth. On the other hand, Lahore was a publishing center of British India, but then lots its sheen because publishing was mainly in the hands of Hindu publishers who migrated to India, mainly to Delhi. Uh, these are just some of the slides of the people who had, um, the, the educated people who came from India to Pakistan. Um, and of course there was the other, um, the earlier one I think, the next one the other group that came and really suffered at the time of partition. Um, fortunately, when the Hindu publishers left, the smaller Muslim publishers of Lahore stepped into the vacuum um, created by the exodus of the Hindu publishers. This is a, a Karachi uh, picture of Karachi around partition. And the Muslim publishers were successful for 15 years from 1947 to 1952 as the successive uh, Pakistan uh, governments continued the colonial policy of allowing private sector publishers to produce textbooks for government schools. Initially, they fl uh, flourished and they grew and began identifying, developing, and commi commissioning local authors to write textbooks. They used the profits from textbook sales to publish general books and organize marketing and promotional activities. Thus, Lahore became the publishing center of Pakistan, although publishers also became active in Sindh and Balochistan and the, the then Northwest Frontier Province. They would have grown quickly, but sadly, um, that happy position didn't last. Martial law was declared in Pakistan in October 1958 by General Ayub Khan. The education policy was amended and government schools um, were not allowed to use um, private textbooks because uh, private text, uh, school textbook publishing was nationalized by the new education policy under General Ayub Khan. A national textbook board was created in 1962 and it was given the monopoly of publishing textbooks for government schools which then comprised the main school market because they were just uh, in those days in the 60s, there were only about 200 private schools, including missionary convent schools. So the main market was the government school textbooks. Later, the national uh, textbook board was split into four provincial textbook boards. Thus, textbook publishing was transferred from the dynamic and thriving private sector to the public sector. And one justification given uh, was that publishers use incentives to get schools to use their books. So the baby was thrown out to the bathwater. 
That monopoly stifled the nascent publishing industry, relegating it to the position of a printer or contractor rather than a creative originating publisher operating in, compet in a competitive marketplace. Publishers ended up as printers for textbook boards. The textbook board monopoly killed competition and led to the drying, drying up of academic and general book publishing because publishers had used their profits from school textbooks to publish books of general interest. After that, private schools suffered a setback when the Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto government nationalized private schools in the 1970s. Fortunately, the nationalization of private schools was later reversed and led to the explosion of uh, private schools, resulting from the steep decline of government schools across the country, caused by the use of substandard textbooks, poor government, governance and management, and the growth of a middle class which demanded quality education and resources for their children. Um, these are a few photographs of private schools. And we'll just show you f uh, pictures of state schools for comparison. The government realized its inability to provide quality education and adopted a laissez faire attitude towards private schools, which encouraged entrepreneurs to set up more schools. It was an exciting time in Pakistan as private schools and publishers came into their own and competed to provide the best books and services to a growing and demanding customer base. There was creativity, technology, and the pursuit of high standards to fill customer needs. Innovation was, cat and was catalyzed and schools and publishing grew, grew rapidly. Uh, there's a government school. Private schools generated a demand for quality textbooks and resources which motivated publishers to develop writers, designers, illustrators, editors, teacher trainers, compensate them well, and ensure the ready availability of high quality textbooks. This also led to greater contacts and collaboration with publishers in Singapore, India, the UK, the US, with Pakistani publishers who obtained rights to adapt and reprint their books for Pakistan. Foreign publishers began to take Pakistan seriously and enter the market either directly or via local publishers. This exposure of local to more established international publishers led to the transfer of knowledge, technology, and best practices. Some publishers became victims of their own success as their books were pirated. That's William Dalrymple's books being pirated, causing losses to not just publishers, but also to authors. Pakistan has very weak um, intellectual property rights and enforcement and a mindset that applauds piracy. But that's another story, and it's a very long story. So I'll just um, now talk about my own experience. I was fortunate to be in publishing at that time. My career comprised various phases rather than a continuous span. It's been a long journey in which obstacles had to be overcome and glass ceilings shattered. It was both exhilarating and disappointing, depending on the phase. There were many important lessons I learned along the way about how to build, develop, and grow a publishing business and what the pitfalls were. While at OUP in the 1980s, I was responsible for promoting its books in Punjab and the Northwest Frontier Province. I turned up in Peshawar and went on a market visit to booksellers armed with books and catalogs and traveling in a rickshaw. I walked into a bookshop and introduced myself. I was dressed in the comparatively modern Karachi clothes and saw expressions of shock on booksellers. When I said, they got up when they saw me and they wouldn't offer me a chair, let alone a cup of tea, and asked me to send a man instead. When I said that wasn't possible, they agreed to listen to my pitch while we remained standing. Now, whenever I'm promoting books, I try to um, get the customer to handle the book and turn its pages, because I feel that way they'll develop a relationship with the book and soften towards it. So I did the same. I handed over the book to the bookseller, and accidentally, my hand grazed his hand. Uh, um, he shrank back in horror and left me no choice but to leave the shop immediately. 
I didn't give up and I went again the next morning and again the next morning. After several visits to Peshawar, they relaxed. And we reached a stage when I could actually sit in the shop and have a kappa. After some years with OUP, when I moved to Karachi, I felt I wasn't getting the opportunities or challenges I needed. Its policies didn't align with my ambitions to publish, so I left and I started my own company, Sayyid Books, in 1986. There is the, <laughs> I was having a book fair in Karachi. I ran it successfully for two years. My staff grew from one to five, and the business began generating an income. I saw to my delight that although I was making all the payments to my principals and other creditors on time, my bank balance was rising. Still, although trading was profitable, I didn't have the resources to publish, which is what I really wanted to do. And then I got an offer from OUP, from uh, Roger Boning, who's here, <laughs> to become the country head. I found the offer tempting. Having worked for an organization at different levels, it's exciting to get a chance to lead it. However, everyone in my family dissuaded me, especially my sister, Noshaba, who felt strongly that I should not trade a growing business with a salaried job. When I showed my enthusiasm for it, she said very simply, you must be mad. <laughs> However, I had made up my mind to lead OUP as I felt that trading was all right if one wanted only commercial success, but my interest was publishing, which required resources. I didn't want to end up as an importer of books, albeit a successful one. I wanted to become a publisher in the true sense of the word and publish books for Pakistan, written from the Pakistani perspective and mirroring the local environment. I wanted our children to read books that would make them independent thinkers and proud of their country and heritage and not produce colonized minds. I wanted colorful books for children that were sensitive to our culture. And I wanted to publish books written by our novelists, academics, and children's writers. Um, pictures of my early years at OUP. A week after I took over OUP in August 1988, President Ziaul Haq died in the Bahawalpur plane crash. And a few months later, Benazir Bhutto became prime minister. The rapid growth of private schools in Pakistan created great opportunities for publishers and are geared to benefit from the growing school market. I wasted no time in grasping the opportunity by investing heavily in human resources at OUP uh, and also investing in the development of an extensive publishing program and infrastructure, including a custom-built office and warehouse in Karachi. We try to come up with, an, with innovative marketing, promotion, and sales strategies to project authors in order to become the dominant player. Um, freedom to publish. How much freedom did I have to publish? I will talk about my own experience. Uh, was there freedom to publish in Pakistan? I would say yes, quite a lot. And I'll give you some examples. I found that freedom was restricted, not so much by the government as by individuals who didn't like what was revealed in books. The separation of East Pakistan was published uh, by us in 1990 on the sensitive issue of the creation of Bangladesh, uh, written by Hassan Zahir, who had spent many years in East Pakistan as a bureaucrat. In those days, what happened in East Pakistan and the creation of Bangladesh were considered taboo. The book generated a heated debate as it brought out into the open issues that had hitherto been brushed under the carpet. It sold like hotcakes and acted as a catalyst in, in encouraging others with similar first-hand experiences in East Pakistan to write their own versions of the breakup of Pakistan. No restrictions were placed on me, nor obstacles created for this book by the government of the day. In fact, Benazir, uh, Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto herself attended and spoke at its launch in Islamabad. Many disagreed with what the author divulged, but responded by writing their own versions. And we published those as well, as we wanted to project all angles of the story. I never took a position, had no political agenda, and remained neutral as a publisher should, 
and published many books on the same subject, but from totally opposing perspectives, thus giving readers a chance to look at the whole picture and discover for themselves where the truth lay. I scouted for books that had something new and original to offer and were well substantiated. Hassan Zahir's book had a great impact on our publishing program and manuscripts flooded in, making me aware of the strong possibilities. I saw a promise in the air. We published many books on the East Pakistan issue. One of them was The Betrayal of East Pakistan by General Niazi, who was responsible for Pakistan's military failure and human rights violations in East Pakistan and had surrendered to an Indian general. People were very angry with him. I was roundly criticized for publishing General Niazi's book, but I stood my ground and I defended myself by saying that General Niazi, whatever he was, had a right to present his viewpoint, whether we agree with him or not. And if they disagreed, we, they should write their own book to counter him. Some people actually told me, we're not going to buy this book because we don't want him to get royalties. <laughs> After that, we published Stanley Wolpert's Jinnah of Pakistan. That was originally published in the US during the rule of Ziaul Haq. It was a path-breaking book but one of the passages mentioned Jinnah enjoying ham sandwiches and whiskey. The Ziaul Haq government banned it and insisted on those sentences being deleted and in fact said they would buy enormous quantities if they were. <laughs> Professor Wolpert refused. Fortunately, by the time I joined OUP, Zia had perished and then Benazir was elected prime minister. The ban was lifted and I happily published the book for Pakistan to Professor Stanley Wolpert's delight. Feeling encouraged, I bought Urdu translation rights for the book and commissioned a translator. I was told by everyone, you were lucky to have got away with the a mention of ham and whiskey uh, because the book was in English and the real readership is in Urdu, but don't take the risk of publishing it in Urdu. I did. I took the risk and there wasn't a murmur of protest. I became even bolder. Then we published the book Military Inc. Inside Pakistan's Military Economy by Aisha Siddiqa. Now the book um, caused a problem not so much for its content as for the way that it was unofficially banned. The book was about Pakistan's military um, economic empire. I arranged its launch in Islamabad and I was about to go there from Karachi when I was told that the venue that we had booked for the event was no longer available. I thought, no problem, I'll get another venue. I rang up other hotels. All of them refused. I tried every possible venue in Islamabad, couldn't get it. The media got wind of it and went to town with the news, making the book into an instant bestseller. <laughs> it flew off shelves. So I arranged an immediate reprint. I received an unsigned written message. Somebody dropped it off at the office that stopped reprinting this book. I was told that two men left it at the gate. Um, I, but you know, the temptation was too great. The book was selling like hotcakes, so I continued reprinting. We sold 20,000 copies in a month and there was no further reaction from anyone. At the Pakistan Literature Festival that we held in London last weekend, we launched the memoirs of Iskandar Mirza, the former president and governor general of Pakistan, who was deposed and sent into exile in London by General, later Field Marshal Ayub Khan in 1958. The memoirs were written in exile and have been lying in a drawer for over half a century because according to the family who are here today, uh, no one was prepared to publish them. My company, Lightstone Publishers, has just published these memoirs, which are of critical importance because they cover the history of the first decade of Pakistan's creation. Sadly, Iskandar Mirza, President Iskandar Mirza's papers were confiscated and perhaps destroyed. So this book, based on his memory, is the only account of that critical period when democracy was destroyed in Pakistan. So my experience has been that out of the hundreds of books of academic and general interest, 
books that I have been involved in publishing over the last 35 years, I can only give you a handful of examples, and those two from both official and unofficial quarters. Thus, the field has been, I, and I say this with, with confidence, the field has been open for publishers, and it continues to be a vibrant scene. Coming to school textbooks, it's a different story. Having said that, I have to add that a line is drawn on school textbooks, and we can't be too careful. Self-censorship is applied here. For example, we use the acronym PASSNIP when editing school textbooks. If you want your books to sell, you have to be careful about avoiding photos or texts of the following. You can see what PASSNIP stands for. <laughs> Politics, alcohol, race, religion, sex, nudity, Israel, India, and of course, pig. <laughs> the single national curriculum in 2020, um, you know, after I had set up my own publishing company, Lightstone, publishers were hit by COVID, which led to school closures and lockdowns. They had barely recovered from that when the single national curriculum, which was neither single nor national, was enforced by the Imran Khan government, resulting in publishers' stocks becoming unsaleable as schools were forced to use books based on the single national curriculum, for which no objection certificates had to be issued and obtained from provincial textbook boards. That involved a long convoluted process and, ex and a very expensive process because we had to pay the textbook boards for reviewing our books. Every single book had to be reviewed and heavy fees were, were paid for not just the review but for the approval and the um, NOC, no objection certificate. In the process, we were forced to rewrite, re-illustrate, redesign these books and submit uh, lots of color photocopies before the NOCs could be issued. For example, what did we have to do? No bare arms, legs, or heads of women and girls could be shown. So changes had to be made in the text. It was made mandatory to write Rehmatullah Aleh, which means God bless him, after the names of Jinnah and Alama Iqbal. A book had a picture of children playing in which a child threw um, a sheet over his head to become a ghost and frighten his friends. This had to be removed because it was deemed to be un-Islamic. You can't have ghosts. <laughs> so books were actually mutilated. And when publishers protested about all this, they were called mafias. And imagine the despair of schools that they can't use any book without an NOC. Raids were conducted on schools, and bags of children, cupboards were searched, and fines and closures were threatened if schools were found using books without NOCs. Even after the departure of the Imran Khan government, I'm sorry to say this is still intact because of the power and income it gives the provincial education departments. Fortunately, uh, and I must commend the Sindh government uh, that rejected the single national curriculum and the NOC process. So publishers from all over Pakistan rushed to Sindh to sell their stocks. Just a few words about the education landscape in Pakistan. It's still exciting and vibrant, covering the country where people live in mountains, deserts, and plains, which make connectivity and access difficult, needs creative approaches. Pakistan is a land of cultural, ethnic, linguistic, and social economic diversity whose richness and vitality needs to be recognized by the education co um, ecosystem and celebrated. Being rigid or stratified will not work because we can't treat the country as a monolith. Dealing with Pakistan's diversity, varied geography and landscape is a challenge that needs to be understood and appreciated before we can deal with it. We need books that make education relevant and prepare children for life and work and to think for themselves. And of course, we can't have books that promote rote learning. A solution that works in one place or a particular set of conditions may not work in another. Therefore, the only way to succeed is to pioneer new ways of deliver delivering resources, assessment, and professional development. I have long felt that Pakistani authors did not get the recognition and awards they deserved. When I went to the Jaipur Literary Festival, 
in India in 2009, I saw how authors were regaled and came back determined to do the same for our authors. With support from the British Council and my friend Asif Farooqi, I launched the first literature festival in Karachi in 2010 and in Islamabad in 2013 to promote reading, writing, and to honor and award our authors. My happiest moment came when I saw a large group of people moving in one direction and I feared there might be some untoward uh, incident. So I rushed towards security. But then I saw that an author from Sindh, Amar Jalil, was being followed by his fans who wanted his autograph. And I felt um, that my dream had come true. Another revealing moment at uh, the festival was when I saw a little boy who had come with his father pointing to a pile of books at the book fair area of the festival. And he asked his father, but today is Sunday, why are there books here? <laughs> so I felt, um, and then there was a wonderful uh, speaker who gave, um, who was speaking in a session. And again, I saw a little boy standing in a corner. And uh, then when they said uh, question and answers, I saw his little hand go up, but sadly he didn't get a chance. So I asked him, I said, uh, what did you want to ask? You, uh, I'll convey your question. He said, please ask him how I can learn to speak English the way he's, he does. <laughs> so, you know, I just felt that we've created this aspiration in people. So publishing, uh, that those are pictures of the festival. Publishing in Pakistan remains exciting. It's a writer's delight. From children's books to doctoral theses, esoteric and research works, fiction and poetry, and informative writing in several languages, there's so much to publish that I feel overwhelmed. Pakistani, Pakistan's children need to be entertained and informed in multiple languages, and it provides a great potential for children's writing. I see so many unexplored themes for fiction. The, novel, the novels written here are usually about middle class, written in Pakistan are usually about middle class life. But there are so many themes waiting to spring to life under a writer's touch. The lives of people living in refugee camps, people as haris, men and women subject to karukari, which is murder, children used and abused as laborers, the drug picture, imprints of poverty and backwardness. There's so much to write about. There are vanishing arts and musical forms and instruments to be documented, architecture in little known places to be captured, unsung heroes and heroines to be identified, obscure ways of life, unique customs, and little known languages and literature to be recorded. Themes for PhDs and opportunities for pioneering research are not hard to come by in Pakistan. You can still stumble upon mysterious long concealed treasures. There are valuable archives hidden in the homes of families. So if you have imagination and courage and persevere, there is potential. However, capturing the market is no rocket science because whatever there is can be surpassed. Once the market has been captured, one finds oneself on a plateau and there's a temptation to sit back and bask in one's successes and gains. However, there's so much more to be done that the view from the plateau is breathtaking. In 2019, I was delighted to return once again to my own business after a gap of 30 years with Lifestone Publishers in Karachi. I feel as if I've come home after a long detour. And I think my sister Noshaba would have approved because earlier she'd said I've, I've lost my mind. The scope of publishing in Pakistan hovers in the air, waiting for the right conditions and for the harmoni harmonious blend of scholarship and enterprise. I continue to work towards that. Thank you.